A Lit in 10 Discussion with Lisa M. Kendrick Searching for Summer by Joan Aiken Joan Aiken grew up in England in a literary household. Her father, Conrad Aiken, was an American poet and her stepfather, Martin Armstrong, was a fiction writer. Her 1962 children's novel, The Wolves of Willoughby Chase, was a hit with critics and readers alike, enabling her to become a full-time writer for the rest of her life. Though she is most often remembered as an author for young people, readers of all ages enjoy her stories. A story may have more than one setting, and each setting may convey a different mood or atmosphere. To understand the relationship between the setting and the mood in a story, think about the sensory language that tells what a place is like and the feelings conveyed by that language. Aiken wrote Searching for Summer in the 1950s, setting the story in a future 80s. When the story was published, nuclear disaster was an ever-present threat. This story is set in a future when the sky is no longer blue as a result of a thick cloud belt which limits the amount of sunshine and makes the climate cool. The change in climate was caused by the explosion of nuclear bombs. This is not merely the result of one writer's imagination. The setting mirrors a situation that scientists call a nuclear winter. Lily and Tom hop onto a scooter. Their goal is to find sunshine for their honeymoon. But the road is gray and gritty, the countryside gray and chilly. The sun is out so infrequently that if it's out, people come in trucks and buses to see it. When the scooter breaks down in a small village, the people seem kind and considerate, except for Mr. Noakes, who is totally rude and unsympathetic towards anyone from whom he can't make money. Lily and Tom are put off by Mr. Noakes, especially when he laughs at them for looking for sunshine. He says that if he could find sunshine, he'd take that land and make money. To get away from him, the couple decide to go on a walk to return a handbag that they saw an old lady had dropped on the side of the road. The bag belongs to a widow, Miss Hatchings, who lives in a cottage with her visually impaired adult son, William. Miss Hatchings receives them with open arms, and Lily is exhausted after the long, winding trek from the town. Miss Hatching graciously invites them to stay the night, and they happily accept. Because you see, at the Hatchings' humble home, there was sunlight. There had always been sunlight in that spot. Three days Lily and Tom spent chatting with the Hatchings, soaking up the sun, and marveling at the blue of the sky in the day and the twinkle of the stars at night. Tan and happy, they suddenly remembered they had to go get their scooter from town. In the end, Lily and Tom had to drive north, away from that spot of sunlight. But the Hatching's home remained undisturbed. Mr. Noakes never went into the wood and found it. Tom and Lily had done what they had intended. They had found the sun. Now they would be able to tell their grandchildren. Long, long ago when we were young, in the days when the sky was blue. Many critics have commented on Aiken's ability to write stories that seem like folk tales. Elements of that is rampant in this story. The story has characters who represent both good, Tom Lily the Hatchings, and evil, Mr. Noakes, it has a secret cottage deep in the woods. There's a fantastical setting that is either totally gray or sunny and warm. Goodness is rewarded. The whole story almost sounds like a legend. The theme here is about decisions and about taking things for granted. I believe that Tom and Lily did the right thing because they preserved that spot forever. You see, many people live their lives not really appreciating something they have never lost or the fact that they have something others crave. The Hatchings take their sunny spot for granted. They don't fully appreciate it because they've never lost it. Yet, greedy people like Mr. Noakes would take something beautiful and destroy it. 